amazing people, you always want to work with them. If you see several of them, you know, go after a new space, you better do the same, right? Like we in the venture capital industry have that, I would say, forged in that event where founders lead us there. He said something that still resonates today, which was, I want every single person who opens up the Snap app to smile and feel happy. It's like, wow, you know, it's pretty powerful. Normally, when it comes to like later stage companies, it's a lot more about the metrics and less about the storytelling. So over there, you know, companies tend to be buttoned up because the expectation by growth investors is that, oh, I need to see your financials and this should be in extreme detail. I want to see a model for the future and it should be pretty good. Uh, Nico, it's good to see you. It's been, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. You have been uh, one of the most well-known investors for the last 13 years, as you mentioned earlier. So it's pretty excited to have you here. But let's start by your uh, prehistory. What's a prequel before becoming an investor? Sure, Kiriako, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on your podcast. Really excited for this conversation with you. So before joining General Catalyst, our firm, about 13 years ago, I was in the business of collecting a lot of academic degrees. So I was made in Greece, grew up between Greece and the UK, and for uh, almost, you know, like seven and a half years, I was in college and I collected degrees in electrical and computer engineering, manufacturing engineering and management, did, re did research in biomedical signal processing, and then uh, ended up at Stanford in 2009 to study management science and engineering. And at that time, everyone and their mother was building mobile apps and was interested in building the next big social network. So it was a great time to replicate. Unfortunately, we're a few years, you know, too late. But during that process, met a lot, a lot of venture capitalists and uh, ended up joining our firm, GC. What brought you to Stanford? I think it's it's more of the rare moves for, for European founders. So what got you there? Yeah, I was really inspired uh, by a lot of the content I was seeing, especially on eCorner at the time. Uh, they had a ton of notable today and back then somewhat notable founders tell their stories showing up at Stanford as part of the Entrepreneur Thought Leader Seminar Series that the Management Science and Engineering Department was running at the time. Um, and I was really inspired by the content that I was consuming because I had like content, but for all things, tech, entrepreneurship and engineering. Uh, so I filed an application, was fortunate to get in, got the full bridge scholarship that let me, you know, like have access to capital and do it. And that was it. And what would you say, uh, was different in Stanford? Did you find something different than the days in Cambridge? I think uh, Cambridge certainly was a lot more fun because the social life there was a ton more vibrant. And for some reason, at least at the time in 2000, you know, like eight, 2009, when I was there, folks were not as obsessed, you know, with like finding a job and planning up their next career opportunity. At Stanford, everybody was like, oh shit, you know, we're deep in student debt. We need to make it work. However, the connectivity that Stanford had with Silicon Valley was like incredible. Like you could walk around the campus and see, you know, Steve Jobs walk his dogs, you know, or you could go to the grocery store and see at the time, Mark Zuckerberg, Aaron Levy, like all those people who were like young millennials at the time doing a grocery shopping. Um, mm. And you could call the email all those people. Like, like a few of my classmates and I called the Elon Musk and he applied and we saw him. So connectivity, but uh, Stanford had with Silicon Valley was incredible for those of us who were really eager to put it into use. Can you tell why is the is the case? Because every every time I come to Stanford too, it's it's near all the big investors as well. They are very close, and I'm, and I'm always wondering why is this not the case in Europe? Why why would you not have the same near Cambridge, for example, or Oxford? I, I don't know. And also Europe has changed, you know, like for a month, I can't speak to Europe, but what I can tell you about California, my theory is that it's because it, it's a newer place still, like the whole area, you know, has a history of less than 150 years, you know, at least it's a civilized place. And as such, uh, 
there is that feeling, you know, that we're all in this together. Failure is an option and it's okay to fail. Maybe you learn something, but let's help each other so we can all rise, you know, uh, together and uh, increase the size of the pie. In Europe, I found by virtue of, you know, mostly growing up here and now having done a little bit of business here over the years is that things tend to be more formal. This is also the case in the Eastern, you know, part of the United States too. And that you need like to get a trusted introduction to go and meet somebody important, etc. So that's my theory, but I don't know for sure. And then how did you hear about GC the first time? I've heard about GC through a Stanford classmate friend of mine who got an email from Chris Farmer, now the CEO of Signal Fire, a really awesome venture capital firm, saying, found your profile online, you're really interesting, I'm looking for a VC associate, do you want to interview? And that friend of mine said, I'm not interested because I'm moving back to Europe, but I have a friend of mine who's interested in doing that. That friend was me. And uh, that's how I got connected to GC, and I'm eternally grateful to Chris for giving me a chance, and of course GC, to join the industry, because I was not thinking about doing so at the time. Mm. And then GC at the time was, was it a very successful firm, would you say, uh, or was it different than today? GC at the time was 10 years old. We were only in Boston. And the idea was that we would expand in the West Coast with Haman Tanesia and one of the other partners at the time moving to um, San Francisco from Boston. And they recruited Chris, who recruited me, and couple of other people from Boston, emerging investors moved, and that was the initial team. So we're a very well known and successful firm in Boston, but we were unknown in California and our best portfolio companies in California were known as other, you know, California based firms, uh, portfolio companies. Hmm. So I would describe DC at the time as a very well funded, you know, startup that was opening up a new office in California trying to compete with the legendary firms and their home turf. So probably it's been uh, a very long way since because GC is considered one of the best funds, funds in the world today. So what was the first thing that you did when you joined? Maybe it would be very interesting to hear your journey and how did this office grew and now that you're in uh, Europe as well and around the world. Uh, so what, what was the first role that you had there and how did this evolve? Yes, sure. So when I joined, I was not a decision maker. I joined as an associate to help the team of six at the time in California get started on the ground and then work very closely with Chris Farmer, who was the lead, and uh, our partner, Amantineza, who had just moved you know, to California from Boston to establish the nationwide seed program for the firm, which was a new activity uh, and initiative at the time. And uh, in my first year at GC, basically I was a young person on the team who was spending all of my time pretty much on campus at Stanford, meeting everyone who said, I am a, a student founder, I'm interested in startups. This was job number one. Job number two was to go and meet with as many of the YC companies uh, uh, that were going through the program in 2011, 2012, and granted it was much easier because it was like a few tens of companies per batch, not like, you know, the several hundreds of companies per batch now. And thirdly, I was uh, also, you know, paying attention to the app store, uh, like the mobile app store and anything interesting that I really liked, it was called inviting the founders. Mm -hmm. So my job was in essence to source compelling investment opportunities mostly in companies led by young millennial founders. Was that the period when you meet the Snapchat founders? Yeah, I met them through a lot of the Stanford connections uh, that I had a year later in 2012. So I met them when they were still seen, when Evan was still a senior at Stanford. And uh, uh, this is the beginning of the journey with them. And then uh, can you recall uh, when you met them, would, were you thinking that they would become the company they are today? 
No, I was not. But I do very much remember the first meeting because Evan had a point of view building the fastest camera app out there. He was the only founder had not till that time that did not want to build on top of Facebook. Everyone and their mother at the time who was doing stuff in social networking or consumer in general was building on top of the Facebook graph. And thirdly, he said something that still resonates today, which was, uh, I want every single person who opens up the snap app to smile and feel happy. It's like, wow, you know, that's a pretty powerful um, feeling that your product, you know, uh, could evoke. Of course, you know, it was hard to imagine that uh, Snap would own the selfie revolution in the years that followed. Uh, and it turned out to be a perfect storm because at the time, the iPhone for the first time had a high quality front facing camera. And, uh, a lot of young girls at the time, teenage girls, were really eager to take selfies of their of themselves while they were going through their day, and share it with their uh, besties. Um, and you know, over time, this became uh, one of the leading communication and entertainment platforms that we have. And recently, they surpassed what now eleven years later. Since then, seven hundred and fifty million monthly active users. It's pretty cool. Looking forward to when you do that, okay? With Terrace. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, and then, um, okay, and then uh, when, when that was one year in into Jira Catalyst, and then how did, uh, when did you this become was, a This was a, 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 year, a year and a half, yeah. In. A year and a half, okay. And yeah. when did you become a decision maker? So I, I was even the ability to write drugs as a principal in 2013, but then I made partner in 2015 and then became a managing director in early 2016. So it took me basically, you know, call it five years to climb through the ranks uh, and become a partner at the firm and mm -hmm. represent the firm on boards, etc. And did your philosophy change uh, over the years when it comes to where you invest? Of course, because as much as I wish, you know, I could in, on invest in photo sharing, communication apps and stuff that I enjoy using, the market conditions, the founders pool and uh, the technology uh, changes around us. So, for example, if I were to quickly rethink, you know, my venture capital investing career over the last 13 years, I would say the first five were pretty much devoted on most we're devoted to first time founders building mobile products, a lot of them consumer facing. Why is that? Mobile apps had an easier time back then with distribution. And then very quickly, you know, in 2015, 16 became apparent to me and a lot of others, uh, that had the era of easy growth had come to an end. So I made the transition to mostly become a future of work investor, investing in solopreneurs, SMBs, uh, and individuals to help them with having access to more opportunity, make more money, upskill themselves, and live a more fulfilling life. And then the last uh, year and a half now, I went back to predominantly investing young technical founders who are building products for themselves uh, because a brand new generation of founders has come online, Gen Zers and Xennials who are different than those before them. So I spent the bulk of my time investing uh, in that extraordinary group of individuals. Hmm. But Nico, it, this uh, requires a lot of you need to all, all the times catch up with uh, what's new. So how do you go about that? It sounds hard, but uh, at the same time, you know, if you are in conversation with so many awesome people that we have as founders in our portfolio, we have as executives and employees in our portfolio companies, I have so many talented partners and colleagues at GC. Um, you know, I, I do network for a living. So 
the best and the brightest that we come across. If we see, you know, some of them being eager to do the same thing, you know, it's like one plus one equals two. Like amazing people, you always want to work with them. If you see several of them, you know, go after a new space, you'd better do the same, right? Like we in the venture capital industry have that, uh, I would say, forged net event where founders lead us uh, there. They lead us to the future. So you would have a lot of smart folks around in GC and then and get to meet a lot of uh, smart folks around in the world. Y- you mentioned that you are um, a professional networker. How does that work? I said I, I am networking for a living. Like every networking day, for I, living, I, I, yeah. I, I do meet um, six to like 10, you know, founders and others in the ecosystem. Pretty much everyone I meet, I ask them, hey, or some other founders or people that you regularly talk to, to compare notes, learn from, etc. So I write down his names and some of those people I know, some others I don't. Or every time we're interested in investing, we do references and through that we meet others. So again, you know, if you get paid to take meetings and occasionally invest as we do, you meet a lot of us. How can you also at GC we believe a lot in community and content? And in the themes that we're interested in, we're pretty active through these activities that are organized by or also, you know, like teams uh, internally. We uh, do engage with a lot of folks. Like, for example, this past month, I've been traveling all over Europe with our awesome team here on the ground in Europe and hosting office hours along the way. Uh, and I've gotten many hundreds of people from Amsterdam, Berlin. Paris, Tel Aviv, uh, London, of course, where we have a great office, and uh, soon in Athens, our hometown. Are you going to have an office in Athens? No. No, okay. We're we're not. Too small market. Okay, okay. Um, Right. When you meet someone, you mentioned that uh, you meet folks uh, by introductions, but then how can you tell? What are you searching for? Uh, during those meetings, and how can you tell they're great founders? First off, most times we get it wrong, right? But at the end of the day, every time I meet a founder, uh, what I'm trying to answer is the following question. What if she or he is right? How big could it be? That's the question or set of questions I'm trying to answer. And uh, certain people are amazing storytellers, are ridiculously ambitious, can lead or standing recruiters and serve as talent magnets or technical and can build for themselves or customer obsessed. So the more of these, you know, you demonstrate you have, the more likely we are to say yes. Mm-hmm. Those, those are a lot of categories. Can you recall an example for someone that is listening now of Here's what I listened before, and here's how uh, why it worked. Yes, yeah, like for example, when I met you, right? You are certainly not the domain expert in all things there are today, but you're an individual who were clearly ambitious, very curious, were eager, you know, to come and play in the big leagues. I remember you flew to San Francisco to meet me, meet some other people at the time, network. Like who does that, you know, on their own dime, especially as a recent graduate. Few people do that. I think that already set you apart. Two, you're very curious to uh, learn more about uh, your customers. And you've been great all along, you know, asking people like me to make intros to potential customers, learn from them. I, I noticed that you are able to lead by virtue of recruiting other uh, mostly technical individuals, which is an asset if you can do that. Like you already had an awesome, you know, technical co-founder, pro, and also for some reason, you're able to get a lot of the imperial recent graduates mm-hmm. or soon to be recent graduates to do stuff for you on the Jeep. Yeah. These are some of the things I saw, you know, back then when we first invested in you 
in late 2020. And of course, the last thing to mention, well, you, know, you had like insane perseverance, which I think is required for a very early stage founder. I think you were pinging me almost every week, you know, <laughs> at the time to grab my attention or to help me do stuff for you. Mm. Here, here's the, the cheat code then uh, of how to do it. I have a few more questions here. I see that you uh, invest a lot in uh, consumer. Most investors that I hear about are not investing in consumer primarily because of the non-B2B nature of it and it's more difficult to, go, to grow there. Why are you investing mostly in, uh, why, why do you invest in consumer and why are you excited about that? Yeah, so uh, I do invest in consumer, have been investing for a long time. We at GC are very excited about all things consumer investing in particular right now. Why is that? Uh, after a very long time, we have a brand new pool of founders, the Gen Zers and some of the young millennials or Xennials who all live in their heads in the future. They're different than those before them because they grew up in a different setup and they have bright ideas of how the future face of the internet should look like. Uh, the current face of the internet was put together largely by uh, geriatric millennials like myself. All the people who created the likes of Instagram, Tinder, Facebook, Discord, Snap, a cluster being GC portfolio companies, WhatsApp and others, were folks, you know, who are in their mid to late 30s or early 40s now. Um, and... Uh, Here's somebody who is like, you know, 18 to 22 after like 10 to 20 years of having used these products. Now they're like, Hmm, I think I can do it better. So that's one reason, you know, new, uh, founder pool coming online to actually distribution at the moment seems to be easier or cheaper. If you know how to speak TikTok, if you know how to speak, uh, discord. And when you have access to free or cheap distribution as a consumer founder, it's the beginning of the good um, times uh, because you can get a few hundred thousand, if not a few million users to check out your product. That's the hardest thing. As a consumer founder, the hardest thing is to get uh, consumers to give a damn about your product. So if now you know how to speak Discord or TikTok, it's a very big deal. Thirdly, most people indeed, you know, don't care about consumer right now. They don't invest in it. So sure, you know, fundraising will be a little bit harder, but at the same time, it means that you won't have like five copycats go after you, uh, six months after you launch. So you have more time to figure things out. So this is some of the reasons I think, you know, why now we're seeing an early renaissance for all things consumer building with fresh ideas by fresh, you know, new, mostly young people and uh, limited competition. Mm -hmm. So in a few years, we'll become a lot more obvious, uh, and we'll have some sizable early successes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, also Nico, you are, uh, very early stage, uh, investor as well. Uh, it ranges from pre-seed to series A and so on. Why that early? Yeah. So we at GC, um, Earnings are core. So the firm is 23 years old. For the first 10 years, we're only doing early stage investing. Now, of course, we're a multi-stage venture capital firm that writes checks that range from $250,000 to $250 million. By deal count, uh, we are a seed investment firm. So we invest about 40 pre-seed and seed rounds a year that we lead uh, in the US, Europe, and India. We invest in about 15 Series A and early B rounds a year that we lead or call lead. And then we do, you know, eight to 10 growth rounds a year that we lead or call lead. So mm. the early side of the house is what drives all the other awesome, you know, um, funds that we have. What are the... Um mistakes that you see from founders uh, when they're trying to raise funds in the early stages? 
<laughs> I didn't know where to start, but uh, let me say a few of the common you know, pitfalls. One is a lot of founders that don't take fundraising seriously and they think automatically, you know, it would happen for them. So doing it one meeting at a time or not knowing your audience uh, or not like, you know, being prepared for it, it shows. And if you think about it, all of us investors, in essence, are professionals are uh, saying no very politely. So uh, knowing your audience, taking this um, activity seriously, doing it um, with a serious commitment over a few uh, weeks and asking, you know, like some founder friends of yours uh, to really help you out uh, could make a hell of a difference. Two, you could see founders who show up at a meeting and the body language with their co-founders won't be great, or it could be uh, that they disagree, you know, uh, in front of the investors, like it's stuff like that, you know, sounds crazy, but it happens, you know, pretty often. Like what, what uh, can you recall something? Yeah, yeah. You, you could see, you know, like I could ask you something like, hey, tell me a little bit about your technology stack. And you may tell me one thing and then your co-founder will be like, hey, actually, you know, we migrated to something else. And it'll be, you know, you know, that's clearly, you know, a red flag. Uh, or I would ask you, what do you have on your product roadmap? And you would tell me, and then your co-founder would say, yeah, this would be something we'd launch, you know, like a week. Be like, huh. this person's clearly not a product, you know, uh, founder as uh, he makes it sound, you know, about himself. Thirdly, uh, uh, knowing your metrics, not necessarily the case, you know, for pre-seed or sometimes, you know, seed founders, mm -hmm. because there are no metrics, but for some seed and of course, you know, series A or later stage founders asking questions about all things metrics and either, you know, hearing, uh, no answer at all, or then, you know, you hear an answer and you go and verify after the fact when something different, clearly you lose interest. Uh, and so in the situation, if you don't remember a specific metric to say, look, I don't have it on top of my head. Do you want me to email you afterwards or? Can I uh, take 30 seconds out to look? An answer like that is a perfect answer. But to give one that's not partially true or be like, I have no idea, this doesn't show, you know, uh, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I can go down the list, but yeah, uh, these are some of the more common, you know, pitfalls. Yeah. Do, do these change in later rounds? For example, in a Series B, Series C round, would, would these mistakes change? Some of them would say the same, actually, you know, I think anything well, that has to do with people, uh, it could say the same. Normally, uh, when it comes to like later stage companies, it's a lot more about the metrics and less so about the storytelling. So over there, you know, companies tend to be buttoned up because the expectation by growth investors is that, oh, I need to see your financials and this should be in extreme detail. I want to see a model for the future and it should be pretty good. Because if you don't have that stuff and you don't have like a strong, you know, CFO and support you who's been through financing like that before, chances are you're not going to succeed. So like my advice to like founders who are raising growth rounds is to have an awesome, you know, support system internally led by uh, VP of finance or a CFO who's gone through a number of venture capital financing before. In the absence of that, oh my God, you know, you're going to die through going all, going through all the diligence, you know, the diligence requests and you won't have time to fundraise or you certainly won't have time to run the business, you know, while you're fundraising. When it comes to, we spoke about uh, consumer, when, when it comes to healthcare, uh, what are your views? What are the biggest problems that you see there? And what uh, what companies are you excited about? Yeah, so at GC, healthcare is one of the core areas we're investing in. We have our health assurance fund led by Holly Maloney and Chris Bishop. Um, and I would say about 30% of the capital we've raised were investing in healthcare at GC. So we do believe there is a ton of opportunity in the space. Uh, it is one where, and for pretty much everything that we do other than biotech, it's not about like creating new markets, but it's about going after the existing ones with better product, better experience. And of course, you know, 
uh, and fine tune a uh, good market you know, approach. So one of the biggest challenges in healthcare is exactly that because you're not trying to create a new market. You need to have incredible people on your team who understand who owns the budget, what is the billing code, how you can get access to them um, and get paid. So a lot of founders, especially the younger ones, if they don't appreciate that or at a minimum be curious about that, it can be really hard for them to make a dent. So you see the best healthcare teams uh, from day one have individuals and the co-founder or the minimum of the founding team roster who have the Rolodex and have successfully navigated the good market, you know. Uh, side of the house. In healthcare, as you know, it takes time to figure out that stuff if you are like a novice or first time. And when you're a young startup, you can't really operate on, oh yeah, you know, we're going to have our first sale a year later, you know? That's not going to happen because you raise capital for like 18 months, maybe 24. So in essence, you know, if you're a really good company, you raise every year, so you need to demonstrate uh, progress um, so yeah i think that's one of the biggest challenges and especially in the western world in like every country has different you know rules and systems so knowing how to navigate that is uh important in the u.s for example people don't really pay uh out of pocket again and again for all things healthcare unless they're very wealthy but you know, for the bulk of the people, the expectation is that their health insurance, you know, pays for stuff or their employer pays for stuff. So unless you know how to tap into, you know, insurance carriers and employers for uh, money for your service, like they are the real customers in essence, it's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. You may have some success early on, but then the end consumer will churn because they will get tired or they will be unable to afford how to pay for your product insurance. I think Livongo was one of the big successes of, uh, of GC by investing very early. Can you recall their story? Yeah. So my partner, Hamant Neza, was the lead. I was fortunate to be a fly in the wall and be the young person on the deal team. I was supporting Hamant, learned a lot through that process and alongside the man was on the board uh, for a couple of years in the beginning. I would say um, some of the quick, you know, things that um, we got right at the time were the following. One, going after the chronic diseases uh, space was uh, a great idea, and especially going after diabetes because there was a way to... Um, go after eliminating a ton of the uh, healthcare spend that was um, taking place and still takes place in the U.S. Uh, two, partnering with Glenn Toolman and Lee Shapiro from day one was um, amazing because those two individuals had been selling to self-insured employers and health insurance uh, carriers for a couple of decades, you know, before really starting uh, Livonka. So they knew exactly who they should be, you know, uh, selling to. Three, uh, being one of the very first companies to systematically and aggressively target self-insured employers, who turned out to be a new distribution channel at the time, was a great idea. Four, positioning the company as a Silicon Valley company with great product and tech team building a superior product at a time and in a space where all the competition was very junky, uh, made a hell of a difference. Of course, there was a lot of luck involved too, uh, as is always required for all startups, even the very successful ones. But yeah, over a period of six, uh, seven years, they managed to get some really big customer accounts that moved the needle, they went public, and COVID accelerated everything for all things telehealth. Uh, and they benefited enormously from that as well. Awesome. Now, if I change a bit the scope 
Uh, I asked you again about this uh, two weeks ago and you told me I should ask you after two weeks. And so let's make it through this podcast. What are your thoughts in terms of hubs, ecosystems? I know you spend a lot of time in San Francisco and in uh, New York, uh, but you also travel a lot to the EU and Israel and so on. What are your thoughts about maybe the European ecosystem? Things you would like to see changed here? Uh, and then what are the main differences with the US? Sure. So I spend the bulk of my time split between uh, San Francisco and New York. Uh, I would say 80% of my time is spent you know, in these two cities. And then the rest is in Los Angeles and various places in Europe. Most often a combo of London, where we have a terrific team on the ground, led by Chris Bischoff, Tel Aviv, uh, and Paris. I think the European tech startup ecosystem is at an all-time high when it comes to ambition by founders on the ground. And that's pretty, you know, like uh, obvious if you go and meet with founders on the ground in particular, you know, in Tel Aviv uh, and London that attract some of the best and the brightest who want to do uh, startups. You also have fantastic, mostly consumer-facing and AI talent in uh, Paris, and this gives them a shot to be in the forefront of creating some very compelling email companies for the future. What Europe is lagging behind is having a ton of exits that will come, that will result in a lot of wealth get created so that a ton more mafias, you know, can be launched. And you have this uh, very awesome virtue cycle where early employees become very active angel investors. Some of them become notable second time founders, you have a deeper talent pool of executives and mentors that you can tap into. And, you know, you start seeing this reinforcing loop uh, that keeps going and results in the whole ecosystem getting bigger and bigger. In Europe, unfortunately, you don't have the large, you know, like uh, easier to access common market that we have in the US. So that's a challenge. And of course, you know, this is not a concern if you're building a, a mobile gaming company, that's done a con it's not a concern, but if you want to build a online, let's say marketplace where you need to figure it out, uh, for all the different geos on the ground, it could be very challenging, like winning Germany means nothing about, you know, figuring it out in Spain. Whereas in the U.S., you know, sure, New York lives on the, their own planet, but most of the rest feels and looks, you know, uh, the same. You don't need to make any major changes for your product or good market approach. So that's a structural issue in Europe. Uh, and as such, in some instances, it's better for a founder to come from a small country so that they would be building um, for a larger market from day one, they won't be tempted, you know, by their local uh, market. I think um, before Europe had a lot of issues with like uh, the lack of funding or the lack of quality of uh, funding uh, for startup founders to get started. Now I think there's ample funding for like angel, seed capital, series A capital. Yes, there is some less capital available, you know, for growth stage opportunities here in Europe, but, you know, with a number of U.S. firms, including ours, you know, opening offices in recent years in Europe, I think that gap, you know, has been bridged. So it's a question of time. So we start seeing a lot more exits for that ecosystem to become a lot more vibrant and founders like yourself will need to find uh, themselves to migrate uh, to the U.S. Like if you can delay that migration, if it's good for your business for as long as possible, clearly it's great news for uh, Europe. Why do people migrate to the U.S. if they're founders? To recruit executives, 
find more capital, be close to their customers, and uh, be close to potential uh, exit, you know, opportunities. So if more and more of these, you know, are in your neck of the woods in Europe, clearly it's going to be very beneficial for the local ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a trend, honestly. But overall, you sound optimistic. I am optimistic, yeah. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, I wanted to ask you about much smaller market, but uh, because it's home, three things uh, you think that need to happen in Greece uh, so we see more founders uh, and a better ecosystem? Yeah, I think that's a better question to ask people who live and breathe, you know, all things Greece and Greek tech startups in all day long. Have observations, but I can't say, you know, but three things that need to happen because I'm not like on the ground, you know, uh, every day. I think the trend here is also positive because there are 50 to 60, you know, like uh, teams that get funding every year. The quality of the talent increases because more and more uh, Greeks from overseas and others, of course, move back to Greece or move to Greece for the first time to start uh, a business. Uh, we have now some um, successes of notable companies that have raised uh, a bunch of money, like, you know, Ozali, Flexcore, Blue Ground. We've had some early awesome exits with companies like, um, um, get the name, the one from Dubai, Instashop, of course. Instashop, yeah, yeah. Instashop, of course, you know, Viva Wallet. Like there have been enough, you know, early exits that got people believing that they can make, they can have a successful career. And also if you're an angel investor, make money, or if you're an investor in VC funds, make money. This needs to accelerate. And I do believe, you know, again, it's only a matter of time. The Greek startup ecosystem is small, you know, Greece is a small country. We only got started like, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, like Viva, you know, was almost 20 years old when they uh, had this amazing exit to uh, JP Morgan. So with time, it will get better. So I, I, I don't have any specific, you know, asks of things that need, you know, um, to happen. I think the current government made it easier for people to figure out all things, you know, tax. Um, when they decide to move to Greece uh, to join a company or start a company. Of course, there's more to do. Capital is not a concern at the pre-seed, seed, or early A stage. The European Investment Fund has provided ample funding. And now local you know, sources, either government or individuals, are coming online you know, to help. Um, overall, I'm optimistic for Greece. It's a small country. and will take decades for this ecosystem to create uh, a very meaningful footprint. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is the, the business of exception. So if indeed, you know, one company gets started that uh, grows to become massive very quickly, then all uh, the folks who are in the universe of startups overseas are going to start be paying a ton more attention to Greece. That's what we need here. Got it. And then the last question I wanted to ask is, what is the best way for a founder to uh, to get in front of you and, and get a meeting? And what's the worst way? Oh, best way, they can uh, contact me. They can email me. They can find me online um, and contact what, me. What does, what, it, what, like? what does it look like? What is a good email? Uh, a very short email, like a few sentences and... Uh, like why, you know, they think I'm interested in them. So like a very concise, you know, short email. A very bad way is to uh, contact me and say, we have 300 years of experience. We're going to be building the first $10 trillion market cap company. The email comes from the head of investor relations who doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. And the executive summary is a document with 217 pages long. And I cannot view it on my mobile phone, but I need to download it while I'm in front of my life. It's a pretty bad way. <laughs> Obviously, not all these things need to happen, but if one of these you know, things happen, it's a bad way. Awesome. Nico, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. 
Kiriako, thank you. I appreciate you for your questions and for the attention. Thank you.